Arguing from evidence is something that, that I encourage a lot with teachers and through research. And I'm Michael Foyer. This is EdFix, your source for insights about the practice and promise of education. It's great to be here today with our guest, Dr. Jonathan Grooms. Dr. Grooms is an expert on issues related to science and mathematics education, and we're going to hear a lot about the importance of science and math, or what we call STEM education, uh, in terms of the bigger picture of education policy in the U.S. Let me start, Jonathan. Thank you. Welcome to EdFix. Great to see you. Thanks for having me, Mike. And um, why don't we just start with a quick version of what you're currently working on. So what, what I'm focusing on nowadays is engaging students in authentic science experiences, right? And how do we, how do we get teachers to support their students in that engagement? So we want students to do the things that scientists do as, as part of kind of their learning experience. So we need to figure out how best to make that happen in the classroom. Uh, we hear a lot about American science and the and the capacity of American science in a rapidly changing world of technology and in a world where other countries have more than caught up. Uh, what's your general sense of how well we're doing? I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, I, I think that's the the easiest bow that you can put on it, right? We have work to do for sure, but uh, I think our efforts kind of focusing on how students engage with data and, and generate arguments and getting them to think about kind of the broader practice of science is moving us in the right direction of making sure that that our students as they graduate and kind of enter the the real world, so to speak, that they're they're ready to contribute and and help and make sense of this whole kind of STEM you know, explosion that, that's going on. You you taught uh, at the elementary and secondary level. So my my teaching experience is uh, is fairly unique, I, I would think, compared to most educators. So I was fortunate enough uh, after undergrad to start running a, a science outreach program for a university. So I actually went into classrooms K through 12. So any given day, I, I could be at, at any grade level doing uh, science investigations with students and teachers in their classroom. We hear a lot about this in the jargon of education policy and research these days, that kids are natural scientists. I think that's true, right? So there, there's this kind of innate curiosity that students have. They want to try and figure things out and learn about the, the world around them. And it's important to us as, as educators that, that we have to make sure we continue to foster that. So it, it comes fairly naturally in the, the younger grades, the younger students. And, and for a variety of reasons, it, it tends to wane as the students progress through middle and high school. And I, I think that's where you know, we come in as educators and making sure we're providing those experiences that, that really keep the students kind of hooked in and, and wanting to learn and continue to grow their science thinking about the world. And this idea that all children can learn and that all people can learn, and that all kids can become scientists. I have a feeling that that bumps into, at least on the part of some people, different theories about the distribution of talent and who can really become a great scientist. Where are we on our thinking about those issues? That, that's true, and, and there's a, an unfortunate kind of opportunity gap that's been fairly persistent in science education for different groups that are typically underrepresented in STEM fields. They don't uh, historically get the kind of educational experiences and opportunities that, that we're pushing for now. So the, this idea of equitable you know, opportunities and instruction and that sort of thing, it's, it's obviously not new, but there's definitely you know, a, a renewed kind of reinvigorated push uh, in that direction to make sure that we're providing these kind of ambitious learning experiences for everyone, regardless of, of maybe where they're coming from or their background. Say a little bit about your own background. Um, what what drew you into this field? Sure, and it's uh, kind of given my context that I don't think it's very surprising that I ended up in education. So I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, 
dad was a, a high school teacher. Mom was, you know, 30 years in school food service. Both of my older sisters are elementary teachers. So it, it kind of makes sense that, that I ended up uh, a little bit where I am. Science was just always what, what I was interested in. I was good at it. I was you know, one of those students. You just, you give me something and I'd chew on it and, and figure it out. So and you were the kind of kid who always won the science fair? Maybe not always won the science fair, but I was I was at least there and, and in it and as opposed to maybe some of my, my friends. <laughs> so yeah, so that uh, that got me into to college with the idea that that I'm going to school to be a science teacher. That was my plan all along. And then once I got out, kinda got into the, the outreach program. I realized, you know, I, I'm not doing things the best that I could, so that got me back into grad school uh, at Florida State University and had some some great mentors down there, uh, Dr. Vic Sampson and Sherry Sutherland. They were fantastic and kind of brought me through and helped me understand, you know, how I could improve as an educator and then went from there, getting into the, the research and now here at GW. Here's another one of these attempts at doing some, if not myth-busting, some some myth adjustment. <laughs> All right. I, I, is it your experience when you walk into an American, let's say, elementary school classroom, are you seeing classrooms that look the same to you as the kind you were in as a kid? No, there it's there there are differences for sure. You know, there's there's group work. There's science that was happening. I, I if I reflect back in you know, elementary school, I, I don't really remember much of a, a science experience until you know a little bit later in fifth grade. There's a particular teacher, Miss Hills, that that I remember, and and science was her thing. But before that, it, where is Miss Hills today? Is she going to hear this? I, I, I hope so. Okay, I hope good. so. Miss Rhonda Hills, you're awesome. Uh, <laughs> it was a great experience. Um, so yeah, it's it's different i i would say so i mean science is happening not as much as as we'd like it to but but i do think the classrooms are are different even more specifically tell us about one of the places where you're currently really engaged in i mean you don't have to name names but <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so we we have quite a few partners uh across the district and mm -hmm. And That's the District of Columbia. District of Columbia, right? So all the of nation's uh, capital. So yeah, so all of our our undergrads, particularly, are are out in the district, you know, in in our partner schools. They're super eager to have us. They're they're constantly reaching out, wanting our students to to come and and work in their classrooms, to work with you know their elementary age students, to to give them kind of these inquiry experiences, these hands on activities that they know are valuable for their students. DC. You know, it's a complicated place. We've got all kinds of issues of inclusion, diversity, inequality, uh, a history of segregation. What are you finding when it comes to the to the STEM agenda in these kinds of places? It's something that that they want to promote, obviously, and and we're we're out in you know large you know minority population schools, uh, students again that are coming from a kind of high need background, uh, underrepresented in STEM fields. And, and as we mentioned earlier, these students, they're, they're curious. They, they want to, to learn this stuff and participate, you know, in these kind of engaging STEM opportunities. So there's the emphasis there for them to get it. So I, we're, we're definitely encouraged by that. Well, that, I must say that is encouraging because, um, Without getting into any sort of sensitive political statements here, the the general sense is that right now the appetite for science in the nation's capital isn't exactly at its highest point. And it's nice to hear that the kids, in spite of all that, are still it's, interested in the natural world and understanding the difference between opinions and facts and data and all of that. The renewed push of of having students engage in, you know, generating scientific arguments, thinking about data and evidence is is definitely something we need, right? It, it's not not only important for them to understand science, but once they're out of the classroom, they need those kind of skills and and habits of mind, ways of thinking that they can apply to issues that they run into, kind of at the societal level, and and make sure that. They, they may not have to have a science way of explaining everything, but at least know and understand that when it's important to use 
you know, evidence-based decision making and and bringing in the science as it's needed to help kind of wrestle with some of these issues we face. Is it fair to say that the improvement of science education requires to some extent a science of education? Absolutely. It, it's not a matter of of simply putting the information out there and letting the the students absorb it, right? I, I think we've we've moved well past that line of thinking, you know, within the field, with within education in, in general. Uh, so it's it's really about thinking of how can we have students engage in these ideas and put things together for themselves in in productive ways with the help of the the educator and and it's not you know this idea of of having students construct their own ideas again it's not it's not new but it, it's something that we have to keep pushing toward and figuring out how we can do it in you know better ways for for different groups of students right even as we move from classroom to classroom school to school the the same lesson and activity is not going to be equally effective for a variety of reasons you know more than we could get into but you know, we have to be mindful of that, and we can't start to figure that out without uh, doing, you know, this research and kind of poking in various situations and, and seeing what comes of it. Fifty years ago, 40 years ago, I'm sure there were theories of teaching and learning which f today are no longer as much uh, accepted and, and respected. Well, I, I think... You know, one of the the big things that that we're trying to encourage, kind of thinking about, you know, how do we do we get this out there to to practitioners, and is this idea that that students have such a wealth of knowledge and ideas that they're coming into the classroom with, and perhaps for for a long long while we we didn't maybe acknowledge that as as explicitly as we could have or or should have. So there's definitely this effort about to make sure that that we're taking what students are coming in with and and helping them to build upon that rather than just starting where we as the the teacher or the educator think is the the best place to start so kind of remaining flexible and and nimble in terms of the way that that we present information the way that we help students uh, kind of relate to the the things that we want them to learn and making sure that that we're actually moving in directions that that they want to head in terms of of how they're thinking about topics as mm. opposed to to us having you know a, a predetermined path of how we're going to get from a to b within a school year within a lesson if you think back a hundred years ago or more the basic idea was that people were born either with it or without it. And we were going to take the ones who had it and turn them into the great scientists and mathematicians and engineers. And the ones who didn't have it, you know, maybe we'd find something else interesting for them to do. Um, all of that has evolved in part because of, I suppose, ideology, but more so because of science. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this notion of of with it or without it, right, has has kind of changed. It's much more. Uh, uh, we all have kind of these basic skills, abilities, and and ways of of thinking and and understanding about ideas. Those are the things that we want to kind of foster and build on. Whereas you know maybe previously you already had to have the idea, you had to have the end result to be recognized as as quote unquote having it. Whereas mm -hmm. now the the having it is more the the ways that students think about uh, information. And if we can foster their thinking, then the the content, the specific kind of factoids that maybe we want them to to have, they'll follow. They'll mm -hmm. they'll figure those things out. And undoubtedly um, some of that is a function of where they grew up, how they're growing up, what kinds of influences they have at home. I suppose one of the big arguments in education policy generally today is the extent to which schools can be held responsible for compensating for all of the other things in society that put kids at disadvantage. And uh, 
you're working, for example, in, I think, in Baltimore City, yes. which isn't exactly known as one of the most affluent communities in the United States. What's going on there? So I have a project uh, with Baltimore City Schools and uh, in partnership with the Cary Institute. So we're, we're working there to kind of revise some of the things they're doing in their chemistry courses to to bring together chemistry and earth science uh, to kind of tricky areas to merge together, uh, but we're trying to fill some of their practical needs to to have students think about and wrestle with those two content areas. And it's it's challenging. Uh, that's uh, maybe an over-simplistic way uh, of saying it, but there's, there's definitely need in that community in terms of kind of thinking about the way that that they engage students in learning science. And and the students have, as you mentioned, there, there's a lot of things going on in their lives that don't happen between the, the morning bell and the afternoon bell. And mm. figuring out ways to bring that productively into the classroom and tap into those experiences and, and provide science learning experiences that are relevant to to their context and their you know lived experiences is something that that we're working on we're trying to to tap into that and and make it useful knowing how to be a chemist doesn't mean you're a good chemistry teacher being a good teacher without knowing any chemistry is going to make make for other kinds of headaches how are we at finding the right balance here Right, you're you're accurate to kind of poke on that. It, it's one thing to to know the content of of a particular course, and even you know some of the the general pedagogical ways that that you can share information and engage students. But unless I don't know, unless you're in tune with with where you know the students are are coming from and the the needs that they have, those other skills that you're bringing to the table as a teacher are less less valuable. So it's it's a tricky proposition because you don't want in, you know, a teacher prep kind of situation, you don't want to promote kind of stereotypical ways of thinking about, you know, a, a potential group of students that that you may interact with uh, later on, but I think it's one of the the nice things about having so many partner schools here in DC is that mm-hmm. we can actually send our our undergrads and grad students out to to schools that are are likely very different than the ones that that they attended and interact with you know different groups of students different populations and circumstances you know learn from the teachers that are successful at, at tapping into those connections and and figure it out you know in that sort of way rather than you know, me going into a classroom of undergrads and saying, oh, all right, this is this is going to work. This is your go to move to engage these students, because that's that's not accurate. Right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's disingenuous to, to try and think about it that way. So learning is to some extent experiential to and a very preparing extent, future educators is in at least the way we're doing it, the way you're doing it. And partly partly what's in our program here is to emphasize the experiential side of becoming an educator. And there was something that you just said which triggered a, you know, a reminder for me that many of our students who come to G- GW to become future teachers, they're going to go work in communities that plausibly are really quite different from the ones they themselves grew up in. So is that partly what you're you're finding is this this uh, ability for us to go into these schools as a way to engage people with their future clientele, so to speak. Yeah, a- absolutely. And a, a former professor back at Florida State used the analogy fairly often, kind of lamenting some of the things we do in, in teacher prep programs uh, about you know teaching somebody how to swim by standing on the bank. Right, that's mm-hmm. something that that we've done done a lot of you know you can describe mm-hmm. what what needs to be done and explain it and and talk about it but unless you actually get in there and start doing it you're not really going to develop a, and and understand it in the the way that you need to to be successful i love that image of uh, standing by the 
side of the uh, pond or whatever <laughs> and using and, and and thinking that you can teach people how to swim just by lecturing them about okay right arm left arm and yet um even within rather more traditional settings where we're doing teacher preparation such as graduate school of education uh we are developing some innovations both with respect to the content and the pacing so for example i know you're very heavily involved in what we call here gw teach mm -hmm. there is a there is a basic theoretical idea there uh which is that undergraduates some of them want to consider careers in teaching and we can make that possible in a somewhat accelerated intensified way right right we're yes definitely proud of the program it's a a fairly you know new endeavor here at GW so we're excited to kind of be pushing the boundaries in in that sort of way we're able you know following a, a model of, of you teach that's been you know widely successful for you know 20 a little over 20 years now you teach was invented at the University of Texas. University so of it Texas got that absolutely. name. You teach. You yes. teach. Yes, got it. and that's okay. a, a common theme in the the various replication sites. Kind of putting your own you know twist on mm -hmm. on that. And so with GW Teach, right, we're recruiting these you know highly talented STEM majors, allowing them to complete their their STEM major within four years that that they would typically do, and then finding creative ways to splice in education coursework for them to think about you know, how to kind of marry these STEM content ideas that they're learning with some more of the, the pedagogical side of things, some of the, the more theoretical uh, things related to education so that, that within the, the four years they're, they're getting that STEM degree as well as being ready to, to become a teacher if that's uh, what they choose to pursue. And now, of course, we've got something called STEAM. So is this another example of sort of the American charming idea that you can have it all? Or is this one of those tensions that's going to actually dilute the great work going on in STEM, and for that matter, the great work going on in, in arts education? I, I appreciate the STEAM, the bringing in of the arts. I, I think that that there is room for everyone. And I think it's it's important to really think about the the articulation, right? So that that we don't necessarily have this this tension in, in either direction, but more the pushing and pulling in in the same direction, right? We we want to try and move together. I, I think of you know some of the the science practices that I focus on, this idea of arguing from evidence is, is something that that I encourage a lot with teachers and, and through research. And, you know, when, when you take a step back and look at some of the things that we're asking our students to do in an English classroom or mm -hmm. a social studies classroom or, you know, even a, an art class where they're painting or, or creating some sort of, you know, a, a product or, or artifact, we're asking them to, to do similar things. You can't talk about you know, the role of a character in a book without having some evidence from you know, actions that, that the character actually did in the book. You can't analyze a, you know, a historical event without having the different contextual factors at play and trying to decide if one was more influential than another. So, so you're arguing in those contexts. So I, I think there are a lot of complementary things going on in these different subject areas and the extent that we can tap into them is going to be you know, useful for students across all of those areas. Quick question on um, the business of boys and girls learning STEM. How are we doing on that? We're, we're still struggling. I mean, we're, if, you, if you were to plot some, some lines, there, there's still a, a gap there. Uh, I, I think it's, it's closing, maybe not as quickly as we like, but I think that goes back to some things that, that we talked about earlier, this notion of, of having it or, or not having it, right? And we're, we're trying to push back against that. There, there's no reason that any student, male, female, can't engage in science, learn you know, science and STEM, and be you know, super successful at it. So I, I think there's still 
a, a bit of a mindset that that needs to change there, but but we're moving definitely in the right direction. Uh, programs here at GW are are fantastic and highly rated in terms of the you know the the women that they're bringing into their program and retaining and the engineering programs and things. So we're pushing back against that notion. I, I think we're pushing back pretty hard and, and having some success. Well, uh, Jonathan, this has been wonderfully stimulating for me. I want to thank you for being with me on EdFix, and I want to congratulate you on the work that you've done so far and look forward to continuing evidence of uh, great things coming ahead. Excellent. Well, thanks for having me, Michael. I appreciate the conversation. It's been great. If you enjoyed today's conversation, download and be sure to review EdFix on iTunes. For more information about this podcast, our guests, future episodes, we have a website, go.gwu.edu forward slash edfix. This is Michael Foyer, and thank you for another wonderful episode with my guest, Jonathan Grooms.